Jesus is speaking with his disciples and he says, for it is as if a man going on a journey summoned his slaves and entrusted his property to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, and to each according to his ability. Then he went on his way. Now, the one who had received the five talents went off at once and traded with them and made five more talents. In the same way, the one who received two talents made two more talents. But the one who had received the one talent went off, dug a hole, and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. And then the one who received the five talents came forward, bringing five more talents, saying, Master, you handed over to me five talents. See, I have made five more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. And the one with the two talents also came forward saying, Master, you handed me two talents. And see, I have made you two more talents. And the master said to him, well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. And then the one who received one talent also came forward saying, master, I knew that you were a harsh man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you did not scatter seed. So I was afraid and I went and I hid your talent in the ground. Here, have what is yours. But his master replied, you wicked, and lazy slave, you knew, did you, that I reap where I did not sow and gather where I did not scatter seed? Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and on my return I would have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to the one with ten talents, for to all those who have, more will be given, and they will have an abundance. But from those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. And as for this worthless slave, throw him into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The word of the God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Um, you may be seated. Good morning and thank you. You are really indeed a good storyteller. <laughs> I'm looking into your eyes. When you meet someone for the first time, do you pay attention to their eyes? Are people's eyes matter to you for good first impression? You may wonder why I start this sermon with eyes. Well, it is because I believe that the most important clue to understand today's text, commonly known as the parable of talents, is in our eyes. In the first century, Jesus' time, people thought that eyes were windows through which they could look at the status of their souls. The eyes were thought of as not simply a receiver of a light, but a source of light. Through medical sciences, we contemporary people know how the eyes operate. 
light seems through, streams through the pupil, strikes the retina, and generates an electrical impulse to the brain, and images are formed. However, in Jesus' days, people believe that when you look at something, the light comes from your eyes onto the thing you are looking at. Eyes, therefore, quite naturally became a metaphor for the inner life or the soul. The Bible also shows those thoughts about the eye of the first century here and there. In Matthew chapter 6, 22 and 23, Jesus says, the eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? You see, by looking at people's eyes, they believed that they could tell whether someone's soul was healthy or not. I'm sure some of you are thinking, yes, I get the eye part, but what is it to do with today's text? Among biblical scholars, there is this concept called the inner harmonies of the Bible, inner harmonies of the scripture. Scholars believe that the writer of the scripture, like the Gospel of Matthew, put something early in the book that resonates with some stories or passages that come later in the same book. The part of the text that is in harmony with today's text is Matthew chapter 6, 19 through 23 that I just referenced it. It says, it begins with, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust consume and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust consumes and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Then he goes on, the eye is the lamp of the body. Can you see the correlations between the two texts? In chapter six, Matthew talks about storing up treasures on earth, which literally meant bearing treasures in the ground to the first century readers. In today's text, Matthew talks about a servant bearing talent in the ground. Today's text was very, very familiar story to first century audience. Jesus tells a story about a wealthy man taking up a long trip, but has a problem. He has too much money. What to do with his money? Most wealthy people at that time would leave their money with a relative or a trusted friend. But this man decides to do something completely unorthodox, entrusting his fortune with three different slaves. To one servant, he entrusts the five talents, which is about two and a half million dollars in today's currency. Another servant, two talents, which is a million dollars, and the third servant with a one talent, which is a half a million dollars. Upon his return, the master calls his servants together for an accounting. The first two servants, you remember, did a wheel and deal. They have doubled their master's capital, so both are commended for their faithfulness and promoted to even larger sphere of a responsibility. But the third has a very different story to tell. He took one talent, put it in a jar, buried it under a tree, maybe in his backyard, and says to the master, I knew you are a harsh man, so I was afraid. Here, have what is yours. I buried yours, one talent, in the ground. Because he believed he was working for a harsh employer, he argues 
it is better not to take the risk of losing it all. In our current economy, who could argue with him? The master, however, is not amused. He reprimands him for his sloth, saying that if he had been afraid to invest the money, he could at least have taken it up to the street, to the bank, where even a small bit of interest would have been better than nothing. Then he takes away the money and gives it to the first servant. About this man with one talent, please help me think through what did he do wrong? He, con he was condemned to weeping and gnashing of teeth in darkness, which is a Jewish way of saying his life unfolded into endless tragedy. This is the word of God. This is the word of the Lord. He did not steal. He did not embezzle it. He did not lie about it. He gave all the money back. So what did he do wrong? He buried his talent in the ground. So what? This is what people did with their money and treasures in the first century when they wanted to protect them, particularly people who wanted to live according to the word of God did what this man did. You shall not charge interest on loans, the Bible says in Deuteronomy. So many people who did not know how to invest money without charging interest rather buried their money in the ground. This dilemma of the third servant with one talent has given so many troubles to preachers for the last 2,000 years. Professor Thomas Long, who was a renowned scholar of preaching at Emory University, provides a very interesting history of the different interpretation of, of this troubled text. He says, in the late 19th century, preachers, during the height of the Industrial Revolution in the United States, preachers preached that the problem with the man with one talent was laziness. During those days, Pittsburgh steel mills were built, Denver, where I live, Denver Pacific Railroad were completed, and San Diego's electric railroad was also completed. During an industrial age that valued industrialness and hard work as a virtue, the third servant in the parable simply didn't have it. His sin was laziness. In the 1950s, Prof. Professor Long says, when America became the wealthiest country in the world, people paid more attention to meaning of life over hard work. Interpreting the biblical currency talent as talents or gifts, preachers at the time taught the, that the sin of this man was first, not knowing his own gifts, second, therefore, not using his talents for God. God gave different talents to each one of us, but the third servant only looked at others with many talents, thinking about why he didn't have those talents. As a result, he did not even know that he had distinctive talents. Based on such interpretations, many preachers of that time would say, well, if you don't give money to the church, you have the talent of a teaching, of helping others, or of something else. Don't bury it because each of us can use our talents for the glory of God. Well, that is a good message, isn't it? But it is completely wrong. They were out to lunch, maybe out to dinner too. They didn't go to good seminaries. Unlike 
I left school of theology, where Trudy went. <laughs> the talent in this parable is the currency of Jesus' time. It is no more or no less than a currency of that time period. Fast forward to the 1970s in an age of pop psychology. I am okay, you are okay, we are all okay. Preacher said, what was wrong with the third servant was that he lacked self-esteem, self-confidence. While he was growing up, he might have experienced emotional abuse or been hurt by bad relationships. He might be a child of unloving parents who never complimented him. As a result, he grew up to be a man of no confidence and no self-love. So he did not know that he could do anything for the master. Those pop psychologists, the preachers, taught that the man with the one talent is not an object of criticism or blame, but someone who needs love and healing. You can see that preachers of every generation have looked at the text and broad interpretations reflecting the anxieties of their own time. You wonder now, what is your interpretation of the text then? Let me answer by way of a story. I used to live in the Bay Area, San Francisco Bay Area, for 15 years before I moved to Denver. My first year, I got married in February. I got traveled for in March. And I was a local church pastor in Connecticut. And in June, my husband, another Methodist minister, and I packed up and crossed the country. And I was also a parent to new, new, two stepchildren all of a sudden. And I was a brand new professor who had to teach everything from scratch. And then when we crossed the country, we sold one car, so we only had one car. So I had to juggle so many different things and very busy and stressful life. And I had to go to shopping center, place that I enjoy going. So I, I've timed my time at the shopping center and I was driving into the parking uh, lot of the shopping center. But in non-pedestrian way, a woman with a two full bags, it was around Christmas time season, was trying to cross the street that is not pedestrian way. I saw her and I stopped for her so that she could cross the street when she was not supposed to cross. And then, she, as soon as she passed my car, because I was in a hurry too, I started, started my car again. And then she turned around and started yelling at me certain things. So I was uh, surprised. And then she, when she looked at me, she saw a woman who looked very different from her, an Asian woman. And I, so then she started screaming at me again. So I rolled down my windows and heard she was saying, ma'am, in this country, we don't drive like you. I stopped for her in non-pedestrian way and that she was yelling me and that she's trying to teach me that in this country, I, was, I shouldn't drive like the way I did. And so as a minister, I took deep breaths, I put big smile on my face. I said, you're right, ma'am. In this country, if someone is kind to you, you say thank you. Then that made her angry and furious and she started shouting and, and then she finally said, go to hell. And then I said, God bless you. It just, uh, so she followed me to the parking lot and waited for me to get out of the car. And then, and, and so when, after she screamed at me, I said, you know, I'm a minister. You should watch what you say to a minister. And then it helped her calm down. And then when she realized I'm a minister, maybe something triggered her that she started telling her story. So long story short, at a parking lot, I learned that this woman was going through a divorce because her husband uh, had an affair. And she lost her job that week. It was Christmas time, and she became a single mother who had to buy things. So she was living in a crazy. So I told her 
why I said God bless you when she said go to hell. I said I'm a theologian too. I'm not only a minister, I'm a theologian. So in the Bible, when Jesus says the word hell, I said it means Greek word Haiti, which is a translation of a Hebrew word Gehenna, which is Greek pronunciation of a Hebrew word Gehinnom, a place outside ancient Jerusalem, the valley of the son of Hinnom, where people dumped and burnt garbage in Jesus' days. So when Jesus said hell, he was metaphoric, metaphorically telling people, God gave you who, you who you should be. Don't lose the sense of who you are as God created. And then when you lose that sense and compare yourself and be, live in anger, look at the garbage dump, Gehenna. Your life is like that. You go to that Gehenna. Did Jesus really meant that they're going to go to garbage dump? It is a metaphorical language. Now, the Gehenna is one of the highest rental districts in entire Israel. I want to have a condo there. So I said, when you said go to hell, I received it because I want to be there. I want to have a property there. God bless you. This woman was living in hell without going to hell. Amid her typical life circumstances, she only looked at the negative side of her life, and from that lens, she also looked at the world and other people, thinking that her life is that of hell, pouring her anger at others, tormenting herself, treated others with hatred and negativity. There is a Korean proverb, to a, big, to a pig, everything in the world looks like a pig. To a Buddha, everything looks like a Buddha. This woman looked at the world with the eyes of hell, therefore believed that everyone out there existed to make her life miserable, and she lived a life of hell. The sin of the man with the one talent is like this woman, looking the master in the eye, and he says, I know who you are. You reap where you don't sow. You are a harsh man. So I just buried your money in the dirt here. You can have it back again. Now, where in the parable do you see any evidence of the master's harshness? There's a, his overwhelming generosity and big expression of thanks. When the first two who came back having doubled their investment. And let me say here that giving a slave a very large sum of money is something that master in the first century would have never done. The master says, well done, you good and faithful servant. That's the second thing that a first century master would never have done. You don't say thank you to a slave when the slave has merely done when you asked him to do. The third servant didn't lose the master's money, but his eyes, his soul was filled with fear, anxiety, and no confidence and the way, the sense who he should be as God created. Therefore, fearfully, anxiously, and cautiously, he buries the treasures and misses the opportunity for faithfulness. The parable isn't really about money anymore than it is about talent. Nor is this story about a generous master who suddenly becomes cruel and punitive in the end. It is about a servant living with the consequences of his own faith or lack of faith. For those who live in the confidence that God is trustworthy and generous, and therefore you keep hope in the midst of a hopelessness situation, you find more and more of that generosity. But for those who run and hide under the bed from God, 
they condemn themselves to a life spent under the bed alone, quivering in needless fear. The eye is a lamp of the body, and so if your eye is healthy, your whole body is full of light, but if your eye is unhealthy, the whole body is full of darkness. What kind of God is in your eyes? Amen.